Greetings, people of Earth. Everyone watching from around the world, from sunny Surrey and from across Canada. It is COVID Chronicles 15 for the morning of March 26, 2020. And shout outs, shout out to Ivan. Ivan from Sector B49, under quarantine, but a faithful, faithful viewer of the program. Producer Dave Darnley, uh, Charlene and Dwayne, of course, Long Duck Dong, shout out to Terry, Diana, shout out to Angie, Kim, Tanya, Julie, uh, shout out to Tammy, and of course, friend of the show, Lisa. Oh, and a special shout out to Prince Charles. I've, um, to be honest, never been a, a real fan of the royal family, but I understand uh, Prince Charles has tested positive for the coronavirus. So shout out to him. Hope you get better, Prince. I mean, you might be the only guy that actually becomes king, <laughs> the only senior citizen to become king. But um, yeah, I guess not a laughing matter. I, if there is some positives, um, Justin Trudeau's wife, Sophie, Sophie Gregoire, uh, seems to have been recovered now. She, if you recall, uh, tested positive for the coronavirus. And what's interesting, what's interesting about that, of course, is um, Justin Trudeau had absolutely no, um, no thought of shutting down the borders and stopping flights from China or any of that stuff. And then his wife got sick and within 48 hours, those borders, borders were closed, right? So it just shows you people can act when they are properly motivated. Um, so let's go to some updates here. Let's see where we are at in the world. All right, let's refresh this. <clears throat> Globally, coronavirus cases are at 499,952. So I would expect that. Actually, it's, it's, that number is probably already over half a million. Um, countries just haven't reported. And uh, if not, you know, it'll be refreshed fairly soon. Oh, man. Uh, deaths, unfortunately. Deaths are up to 22,327. And if we pause, if we pause and we look at the rate of both cases, cases, as I've said in the past, um, are not necessarily misleading, but they, they can, in a sense, misrepresent the situation in that the more tests that become available, the more tests that are done, the higher the cases will be, of course. You know, if you, if you tested every single person in Canada, um, if, if you said, if you, deter, if you tested 10 people in Canada and you determine for, say, alcohol, and you determine one of them was drunk or over the legal limit, you would think, wow, one, one uh, drunk person in Canada. Then if you tested 40 million people in Canada to see how many were drunk, you would get more than one, right? So the amount of testing really affects, of course, the total cases. However, this, this is something we should be concerned with, the death rate. I mean, it is just skyrocketing. And um, it so, shows no signs of slowing down. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you guys about the rule of 72. I know a lot of people don't like math and um, can find it hard to follow sometimes. So let me know if, um, if you would rather I lay this out in a more elaborate graphical way. But the rule of 72, so like, um, let's say 10%, let, let's say there's a 10% increase each day in um, deaths, right? Well, that doesn't mean you're gonna have a 100% increase in 10 days you have to look at the rule of 72. And um, however, however many times a number can be divided into 72, that will give you how long it takes something to double. So um, let's, say, let's say the death rate was 7.2%. Like um, each day, say you had 100 deaths, right? 100 total deaths. The very next morning, you had an additional 7.2. And I know you couldn't have... Um, 7.2 deaths. But all right, you know what, scrap that. Let's say, let's say uh, you have 
um, a thousand deaths, right? And the next morning, you can, consistently you're getting this number, you have 72 new deaths, right? That would mean the uh, death rate is increasing by 7.2% per day. And so that number would double in 10 days. So it would go from 1,000 to 2,000 in 10 days. So if um, it's 14.4%, uh, then that number would double in five days because 14.4 goes into 72 five times. You can think of this uh, when you get a mortgage too, or an investment. Let's say you invested a million dollars um, and the rate of return was 3%, right? 3% per year, million dollars. Well, three goes into 72, 24 times, right? So that means... And if, because it compounds, right, you get interest on the interest. That means that within 24 years, at the end of 24 years, you would have $2 million. So that is the rule of 72 explained. So that's what we have to look for when we look at the rate at which these are increasing. And we'll go down and we'll look at some real world examples here. So China, I mean, China, 67 new cases, 3,287 3, deaths. I'm really starting to get dubious about this. I'm really starting to have doubts. I mean, it looks like the USA is going to pass China probably within a couple of days. Um, Italy hasn't reported their new cases yet or their new deaths. They tend to do it later in the day. So we'll have that in the evening. Um, they're also going to pass China. It looks like so is Spain. So we have to, we have to be a little bit concerned, right? But I'm going to break out the calculator and I'm going to show you this rule of 72 in action. So let's take a country, Spain. Okay, so we take the number of new deaths, that is 498, right? We divide that, divide that by 4,145. So 498 divided by, oh shit, I got big hands. Okay, 498 divided by 4195. Okay, so that is, Four nine eight divided by four one nine one. That's eleven point eight percent. Let's call it twelve. So how many times does twelve go into seventy two? So seventy two divided by twelve equals six. So <clears throat> the death rate, the currently the death rate in Spain is doubling. the The total death count is doubling every six days because they have a new death rate of twelve percent. So what we want to watch for is we want to watch for a slowing down of that death rate. And it, inevitably, it will happen. It'll stretch to seven to eight to nine to 10 days. Um, and that will be, of course, a positive sign, right? So some other countries we have been watching, um, Portugal, we have concerns basically around, um, I mean, they're right next to Spain. Lifestyles, cultures, customs are very similar to Spain and Italy, and um, that would lead to a much higher, um, much higher rate. Now let's take this number here, right? Let's apply our rule of 72 and, and find out where we're at. Uh, by the way, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed, enjoyed the Mexican story video from last night. Um, you know, it, it was similar in, in this in a lot of ways, right? 17 divided by 60 equals 28%. So 28%, I mean, that's less than three. 28 goes into three, 72 uh, less than three times. So we can expect the death rate of Portugal, the total deaths to be over 120 very quickly, less than three days. Now let's move on to our own Canada. All right, uh, numbers continue to escalate everywhere. I mean, Quebec is really getting high here. And again, they're testing in the province now, so that, uh, it's probably contributing to that a lot. 3,555 confirmed cases in Canada. Quebec's cases have spiked to uh, 30, over 1,300. British Columbia, we continue to have the highest amount of deaths. Uh, this doesn't say new deaths, but, um, you know, 14 people have died in, in BC attributable to COVID-19, 13 in Ontario, 
35 across the country. Um, and so we're looking at some changes in Canada as well. There are a few things we can expect. Um, the government has enacted the Quarantine Act. And I mean, it's, so for people arriving, people being repatriated from the rest of the world, um, initially they had been told to self-isolate. They had, it had been recommended. Um, now it's been made mandatory, of course. Um, I mean, even, even people that were irregular travelers just coming across the border, um, asylum seekers, they were saying self-isolate, please, and actually expecting them to follow through with that. And to be honest, that's probably a large contributor to the problem in Quebec, because I believe that that, um, ir that illegal asylum crossing point was in Quebec and Roxham Road, and now Quebec is really is really taking it on the chin for this stuff, right? <clears throat> but um, I don't think this applies to just travelers. I, I believe this now applies to everybody, the Quarantine Act. So I was very curious because um, fines are going to be issued um, and, and um, possibly jail time. The Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau came on this morning and he said there will be fines and possibly jail time. So what constitutes a fine and what constitutes jail time? I don't know. Again, we, we have these kind of vague descriptors, so we don't really know what the hell is quite expected. And he said, stay home, wash your hands, and if you need to talk to a friend, call them. Okay, so that's it, right? If I don't wash my hands, am I getting arrested? Is someone going to follow me to see if I'm washing my hands? Um, if I venture out of my house, am I going to get arrested? Like, it's very, again, like, I mean... You know, they, they put these things in with this draconian response, and we really don't know what it means, do we? Like we, sure, common sense tells you, okay, quarantine act, that means don't fuck around, don't go into public places. But we don't know. We don't know who this can be applied to, right? Uh, let's find the quarantine act here. Because I, I called up the quarantine act. Uh... This should be it here, is it not? Oh, here it is. Here it is. Um, okay. So this act may be cited as the Quarantine Act. It applies, uh, the following definitions apply in this act. Communicable disease, it means a human disease that's caused by infectious agent. Okay, we get that. Conveyance, so they have all these terms outlined, departure, uh, entry, health assessment means your health is going to be assessed. Um, medical examination. None of these really apply, though. Uh, peace officer, a person referred to in paragraphs of the definition of peace officer. Okay. Binding. The purpose of this act is to protect public health by taking comprehensive measures to prevent the introduction and the spread. The key here is spread. Because we know what we need to do about the introduction. The introduction is to seal off ports of entry and to tightly control commercial transport through that. So that's, that's much easier to manage. The key word is the spread of communicable diseases, right? And believe me, I am all for flattening the curve and stopping this. But um, again, all of this stuff, it lays out what they can do and who does what. Um, powers of the minister. The minister may designate qualified persons or classes of qualified persons as analysts, screening officers, or environmental health officers. So I'm sure this will include uh, police. Uh, who else beyond that? I mean, is your, is your nosy, busybody neighbor going to be designated as the street quarantine officer uh, there to rat you out if you're spending too much time walking up and down your street? I don't know. Uh, the minister may designate medical practitioners as review officers. Okay, that sounds, I guess, somewhat reasonable. Uh, the minister shall have a certificate. The minister may establish a quarantine station at any place in Canada. Okay, I think that needs to be elaborated on a little bit. Are you going to go out for uh, gas one day and then end up being you know, filed off to some building in the outskirts. 
Uh, what else is there in here? Quarantine facility. The minister may compensate, not will, may compensate any person for the minister's use of the place. Hey, well, you can use this office. I'll happily do this uh, this COVID cast somewhere else, right? I'll I'll, I'll do it from uh, my rooftop, maybe. You guys can use this. Please reimburse me if you do. Uh, the minister may, by order, designate any point in Canada as an entry point. Hmm. See, now that's very um, that's very convenient language, right? Like, so the communication can go out that we are going to be monitoring and enforcing entry points. And then you find out that, um, you know, a parking lot is an entry point, right? So anyways, let's, let's move on from this. It's not really a pleasant subject at all. Uh, you can't refuse to be screened. Uh, it, it probably will lead to your arrest for sure. <sighs> so I don't know. I, again, whenever, you know, you, you never want to be the, um, you never want to be the asshole that slows down the implementation of these kind of measures, right? But we, we really have to make sure that stuff is done in a thoughtful way. Uh, it's done in a thoughtful way towards the rights of uh, citizens. I mean, in this country, we owe a debt of gratitude to our ancestors. And I mean, this, this goes to the older people as well that are being um, affected by this, right? These are people that made a country that we want to live in, you know, it's through their work, through their effort, through their sacrifice, uh, through their own self monitoring. Society is a social contract, right? And th there isn't enough power to enforce every law on every book and every practice in every society. They just don't have enough people to do that. You would literally need to police, um, incorporate half the population to do these sorts of things, right? And for example, like, I mean, um, you know, foreclosures, right? Uh, if you don't pay your mortgage, maybe the bank can foreclose on your house. But if everybody stops paying their mortgage, that's not going to happen. It's impossible. <laughs> There's not enough eviction officers out there, right? So I would really like clarification on these things as they come in. I want clarification and I want um, on exactly what is expected of people, right? They love to say ignorance of the law is not a defense. Who the fuck? can know every single law um, that's applicable in the entire country. That's impossible. So yeah, ignorance should be a defense. So if you wanna implement these things and we're all on board for it, be very specific. Let us know how long it's gonna go for, um, what would constitute phasing this out, right? And, and what's gonna be, what sort of standard people are gonna be held to. Is that too much to ask? I don't think so. Um, so that's the Quarantine Act. Another thing uh, that I've come across that I found is a little bit disturbing. Uh, let me see where we are at here. Okay, so this is also very, very disturbing. Ontario health officials sound alarm over impending shortage of masks, protective gear, Uh, to, 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 to Windsor, and this is going on across the country. This isn't just Windsor. Uh, they see, they are asking anyone, like, I mean, asking anyone, what, what the fuck does that even mean? Like, are you going up and down to people on the street and saying, hey, do you have medical equipment? But anyways, they're asking anyone with a surplus of N95 and surgical masks, anyone. So any of you out there have a, a surplus of N95 and surgical masks? along with gowns, nitro gloves, battery-operated thermometers, hand sanitizer, <laughs> wipes, and respirators. Well, I got some wipes if you guys need them. Uh, we foresee a shortage, and we are acting now. Okay, so that is disturbing. That is very disturbing. We have a pandemic that is escalating very quickly, um, and we have known about this. We have known about this for three months, right? You and I, like, Joe Citizen may not have been completely focused on this, this item a month ago, but health officials really should have been, right? Um, health officials and government officials should have been focused on ramping this stuff up, right? 
because they it's a concern and now we're all paying the price we've got a quarantine act on us right we've got an economy that's going to implode on us so um, we're facing shortages on medical supplies across canada but but what has happened here canada sent 16 tons of medical equipment to china and now faces a shortage so yeah you it's really hard to believe this stuff isn't it it's really really hard to believe this stuff it's really hard to believe how reckless and cavalier our country was um february i mean this i knew about this the first case of coronavirus uh, was identified in canada in, on, in january january 25th and we knew it was a problem in january in china okay so we knew it was a problem we knew it had come here right um and still we sent 16 tons of protective equipment clothing face shields masks goggles and gloves hey all the stuff that we need now that was all sent to china right so i mean needless to say um you know this is another thing that is just oh man i, I mean we've been kind of screwed right so they do these idiotic things and then they expect us to pick up the tab right so so yeah we're sending this stuff out to china um and and now we have a shortage like can you believe it uh the u.s let's get to the u.s and then we'll take one look at a strange story strange story coming out of china so the united states they are targeting easter as a return to normal and um you know this is uh it's a rapidly evolving situation when i first had started this COVID cast my goal was okay well two weeks um you know, I got time to kill for two weeks, I guess. Let's do this um, probably April 3rd. I was looking at sort of the ending date. I really don't see things ending April 3rd. And I really don't see things ending um, on Easter either. I, I think that's wishful thinking on the part of the US government. I wish it would. I wish it would end in Easter. I don't think that's gonna happen, but that's what they're gonna try for. So, and again, here's what we need to watch. We need to watch that they don't, we need to watch that bailouts don't go to the richest people running the countries, right? Um, that we should all be clear on. We learn, we all learned that lesson in 2008. If you're old enough to remember the economic crash of 2008, 2009, then um, there was a whole movement that came out of it, Occupy Wall Street, right? Um, we need to watch that these bailouts go to Main Street, not Wall Street, right? But another thing we need to watch out for is that um, we don't see the economy, and believe me, I want the economy to be open. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be one of the victims of a crashed economy, as I'm sure many of us will be. But we really don't want it to be opened up um, so that a few people seem to do really well. They're going to open up um, global travel, but keep the rest of us in the country quarantined. And we don't need it opened up just to benefit specific industries as well right essential industries okay but um we don't need our health we don't need people dying um to get the g gdp up three percent right so here is some news that is both odd and disturbing and this is breaking news you are getting breaking news Watching the Rick Richards show, I'm going to change the name, I think, from this COVID Chronicles to the Rick Richards show. It's got a little more punch to it, right? Anyways, I'm giving you some breaking news. This morning, Donald Trump, and this has been confirmed, I have seen it, um, Donald Trump is looking at putting troops near the Canadian border. So the American government officials inside Donald Trump's White House are actively discussing putting troops near the Canadian borders in light of US border security concerns around the coronavirus pandemic. While this is odd in that, number one, their situation is far worse than ours. Like they've got a way bigger problem than we do. Um, and you know, 
on one hand saying Easter, we're planning on getting back to normal. On the other hand, saying we're going to put troops on the border. You know, those, those are somewhat contradictory and it's odd. They're putting, you know, well, whatever. Anyways, uh, that's, that's their position. They are looking at this and I think this is actually going to happen. Um, few people cross from Canada into the United States at unofficial point each year, but the goal of the policy would be to help border guards detect irregular crossers. And I assume it's happening, but it just can't be in a very large number. If anything, it's coming the other way. We're getting these people coming into Canada. So, um, yeah, and Justin Trudeau confirmed the news while giving his daily briefing to reporters uh, from Rideau College, Cottage, acknowledging conversations are taking place. Uh, conversations are taking place. So what has been the world's longest unmilitarized border may no longer be a thing. And it's, you know what, if we stop and reflect on that, it is actually really sad. You know, I can remember when, uh, see, I'm old, right? Nice thing about being old is you can see things change and patterns. When I was, um, you know, a teenager in my 20s, I used to just get in my car and drive across the border. Sometimes they would ask for a driver's license. Most of the time they didn't. They would just say, where are you going? Get gas. Okay. And that was it. It was actually a pretty simple thing. And it's gradually, it's gradually, you know, it become more and more uh, regulated and convoluted. And it's, we've really moved from a high trust society to, to a society where just everything is just under scrutiny, right? So that is what's happening with the U.S. and Canada. And here is a strange thing that I've come across. I'm gonna need a shot of monster to deal with this one. Tight, tight. Okay, is China hiding COVID-19 death toll? Now, I have shown you the numbers, right, from China, and it's uh, 81,000 people infected and a little under 4,000 deaths, which, which is highly suspicious given a country with a population of 1.4 billion, um, where we know that there are some questionable practices in wet markets, and I don't know if that's completely stopped across the country. We also know that um, uh, journalists in China were being censored very early on. Information coming out of China was being um, tightly controlled <clears throat> and so it's um, it's very suspicious that they have completely got this thing under control, right? So, and here is something to follow on. Um, 21 million cell phones have disappeared. Now, first we could speculate on alternative reasons, right? So 21 million cell phones accounts in China were canceled after the coronavirus, 840,000 landlines were closed in China. Okay, now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion that these people have died, but, um, I mean, you know, to, to be without a landline and a cell phone in this day and age, you know, I mean, the cost is pretty reasonable of these things, even in China. So, I mean, if, if I was to lose... And we could look first at an economic um, explanation, right? Maybe these were people that um, worked in and around that Wuhan uh, province. And so, um, you know, maybe they lost their jobs. Maybe they're going through economic hardship. Maybe they, you know, a cell phone is, um, you know, is a, is a resource that they don't feel is practical at this time, right? But I can say that in a situation like that, I think my cell phone would be one of the last things that I would get rid of, um, you know, right before probably food and gas, you know, that, that would be the last thing. So it's very, it's very suspicious that there's been that many. So since the outbreak of the uh, coronavirus uh, in China's Wuhan, the pandemic has killed 15,000 people globally, which has gone up and infected 351,000. That's up to, that's up to 500,000. Uh, Beijing authorities announced on March 19th that more than 21 million cell phone accounts were canceled. Well, in the past three months, 840,000 landlines were closed. Which gives the idea that probably these closed numbers belong to the people who died due to the disease. 
And further to this, um, Tang Jingyuan, a U.S.-based China affairs commentator, told the Epoch Times on March 21st, the digitization level is very high in China. People can't survive without a cell phone. You know, I know this from personal experience because I know a guy that used to come back and forth from China and his cell phone was his lifeline. Dealing with the government for pensions, social security, buying train tickets, shopping, no matter what people want to do, they are required to use cell phones. And the Chinese government actually encourages the use of cell phones because it makes it much easier to um, control the information that the public receives and to track their whereabouts. The Chinese regime requires all Chinese use their cell phones to generate a health code. Only with a green health code are Chinese allowed to move in China now. It's impossible for a person to cancel his cell phone. So there you go. I didn't even know that stuff. So the fact that 20 month accounts, so in a, in a country where it's virtually mandatory to have cell phones and they are required for almost anything, um, including health numbers, uh, in a pandemic, are you going to get rid of your health number? Like, is, is that wise? Uh, so there we go. Um, China claimed that the health code was helped to help China to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. They did a, they had an app that can generate a QR code, which is possible in three colors to classify a person's health condition. So I guess it could be possible that people are breaking the law and they're canceling their cell phones um, in order to not be tracked or to not be categorized or because they have the virus and they don't want to be, I don't know, isolated or whatever the hell could happen to them. And they're just, going off the grid um, or it could be that they died or it could be a combination of both but it is very suspicious that they would have a sudden drop like that uh, it should be reported that as per the reports china telecom is the second largest carrier and it has lost 5.6 million users in february and lost 0.43 million users in january and it goes on to mention some of the other ones here are some alternate possibilities. It's possible that these workers may have gone to their home city for Chinese New Year and after the travel ban, they did not get a chance to come back to China. It noted, it should be noted that in China, there is a basic monthly fee to hold a cell phone account and the majority of migrant workers who belong to the lowest income group likely only have one cell phone account. Um, the economic downturn caused by the outbreak could have forced Chinese people who have two cell phones to cancel one of them. So there is some, there is some possibilities. There is possibilities that these um, Chinese have just gone to other countries, right? Like if you're, if you're Chinese and you're going to Canada, maybe you're going to say, Hey, you know what? I'll, I'll ride this out in Canada. Fuck the cell phone. Don't track me. I'll see you guys when this shit's done. Right. Uh, migrant workers, same thing. People with, two cell phones, also same thing. So there's, there are possible explanations, but it is something that should probably be watched um, because it does, it does present the possibility that we are not getting the full story, right? And remember, no matter what, no matter what we want correct and accurate information, because the only way you can make decisions, the only way you can make the right decisions is if you have correct and accurate information. So hold people accountable, make sure you get specifics. And this applies to everything. This applies to things in your life as well. This applies to your job. People say, um, if employers say, you know what, we're going to make sure everyone's taken care of. No, I don't want to know taken care of. I want specifics. I want to know when a check is coming. I want to know how much it's going to be. Um, when do you expect this to last? What are you making your decisions on? And they may not have the answers either, but hold people to specifics. Don't look for feel good promises. Okay. So on that note of wisdom, I will say goodbye. Farewell. So long. Adios. Arrivederci. Sayonara. And um, we will reconvene tonight. And I'll see, I'll see if I can come up with some white pills tonight. Okay. Some good news. Bye-bye.